I'm Bob Nosworthy, and I want to take a moment uh, with you today to talk through uh, what we're doing here at the University of New Hampshire's Interoperability Lab and what we're doing around single pair ethernet and time sensitive networking. I'm gonna turn off my video for the moment and just focus on the slides. So this is a series that we're looking to have periodically, um, sometime roughly in line with the various 802.1 and 802.3 uh, interims and plenaries, uh, timed as best we can to avoid other conflicts in the industry so that we can keep touch with both um, the industry members we partner with and those customers and, and manufacturers who, who rely on us to develop uh, the services of, of value to them. So um, this is just the first of what should be several uh, series on, on our activities. So many of you would likely are familiar with uh, UNHIOL, but just as a quick reminder, we have been around for about 33 years now. Uh, we are part of the University of New Hampshire here in uh, Durham, New Hampshire. Um, we're a nonprofit, uh, neutral, third-party test lab, uh, tool developer, uh, test plan developer, standards contributor, um, principally focusing on data networking and storage technologies. And especially in the TSN uh, space, we've been active since residential Ethernet, and Ethernet is where we started way back, way back with ThinNet and 10 t in 88 and certainly have lots of activities around Open Alliance and Avenue activities, which we'll discuss here, as well as some other topics. So we're gonna give a brief overview of our TSN and single pair ethernet activities, or SPE, as we might say, um, go through a little bit of an industry update. And then I very much would welcome uh, those in attendance here to engage with uh, the Q&A process. There's a Q&A um, system here in Zoom to put in your questions as you have them. Um, I'd like to try to keep the questions to this period at the end so we can go through the material, um, but certainly uh, if we can address a question as we're going, we'll, we'll try to do so. Um, but I'd like to have a discussion, not just Q&A, about what you see some of the challenges and problems that you're facing and how we might be able to be of assistance. So looking forward to that. Uh, certainly, um, I'm Bob Nesworthy and focusing on time sensitive networking and our single pair Ethernet, as well as PTP technologies like, you know, of course, 1588, um, involved with many groups that we'll give updates on here, whether it's uh, APL through uh, IEEE certification to end user profile development. Um, and Jason is also uh, with me here on the panel. Uh, Jason Sisk, if you want to. Hello, everyone. Do you want, yeah, I can just, uh, yeah. so I'm newly appointed a uh, SBE technical manager here at the lab. I've been working in the single pair ethernet technologies for the last four or five years. And yeah, definitely actively involved in the Open Alliance uh, groups, mostly looking forward to the TC15 as it continues along. And uh, as well as the 802.3 is in where that's headed. So hopefully we can give a little insight there and keep you guys posted and on that front. Jason is um, stepping into the shoes of Curtis Donahue, who's moved off into the industry as our uh, student employees to staff uh, tend to do. And he's the dot three yang to my dot one yang, if you will. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, for our single pair ethernet updates, we're gonna go through the various speeds talking first here about the um, 10 megabit activities that we have around 10 base T1L and the advanced physical layer. We have been working with the APL group for over a year now and have uh, certification, testing tools, test plans, physical um, test boards, uh, fixtures, if you will, um, developed for that process and continuing to engage and support with that space. While we're also working for full semiconductor compliance of 10 base T1L, the physical layer, PCS, PHI control, auto negotiation, uh, which is, you know, auto negotiation in your classic sense, like you're used to for uh, Cloud 28 style, 100 base TX, 1000 base T, but actually being used now in the single pair Ethernet realm. Um, as is expected with the continued uh, plethora of speeds and capabilities. So that's capability we're working towards. We have the APL capability today, um, including various test fixtures that we have available, line taps for those who may use uh, have a use for them, and test software that, that we're making available. 
And we are spinning up a 10 base T1 focused service area um, to try to better accommodate the needs of, of the space here. Um, and that can be in our classic membership model. It can be a paper test model. Um, and certainly something we're looking to um, help accelerate the silicon validation needs that the industry has in this space. Um, rather than what we currently have, for those perhaps not aware, we have a perhaps poorly named low speed single pair ethernet and high speed single pair ethernet, which yes, is right in that category of bad choices like calling fast ethernet, the fastest ethernet that will ever happen, which is now only one step faster than what we're talking about here. 100 megabit. 100 base T1, we continue to offer several services around the Open Alliance activities. And most significant here, we have an ongoing effort to assist the Open Alliance communities in updating PCS, FI control, and TC10 test plans um, to better match the needs of the industry, address errata in the test plans, and work with them to address um, the ISO standards that are now based from these PCS and FI control um, documents. Um, so that the errata is clearly understood to any trying to implement it, not just ourselves. Um, but those services have been away, available for some time, and we continue to work towards automating and making that capability available in-house for others who wish to replicate our capabilities with the tool that we call Bitfire. Um, so that's certainly an ongoing activity. And again, our low speed single pair ethernet effort is going to go through a rebranding to make it more clearly focused on this 100 base T1 need. And again, there's a variety of options there from paper test to uh, uh, project based needs to support you or your OEM uh, supplier or uh, customers needs in that space. This is a lot of ongoing activity, and I do want to give an acknowledgement to several semiconductor vendors who are closely working with us in this space to improve these test plans to make the testing process more automated and faster, uh, and also develop feedback that will eventually reach not just the ISO standards, but also the IEEE standards um, for, for various aspects of concern, including aspects involving FI control, which I will save to a technical discussion outside of this topic. <clears throat> One gigabit is an effort that we still also have underway. We have physical layer testing available today, continuing to expand that to offer our full stressed receiver testing capability, which we're working to add by the end of this year. And we have a partner in the industry who's helped us with tooling. So we have PCS and FI control testing underway, scripting and tool improvements continuing. That's expected to go through January. Um, but we already are testing at least four semiconductor vendors through this process and providing them as much feedback as we can while we continue to work with the tool provider to improve that uh, particular solution. So that service is continuing to expand and mature. And again, we'll be rebranding that from the high speed single pair Ethernet group to the thousand base T1 single pair Ethernet group to better uh, address the needs and more clearly define what the service is offering. Um, this is also a space where there are test plans in the Open Alliance, and those who are members of that organization have the opportunity to review these test plans and comment on them before they go to the ISO standardization process, which I would highly encourage, such that we can close the loop faster on identifying issues, improving the tooling, um, and making sure we don't have to go through that errata process that we're going through with 100 base uh, solutions. Multi-gig is absolutely an area of interest. We have uh, the support of, of many um, interested semiconductor uh, OEM and test tool providers. I want to give a quick acknowledgement here to Keysight for their um, uh, ability to provide us a, a very capable uh, test system for the physical layer uh, needs, which we've been working with um, for the past several months, as well as some early silicon to kick the tires, if you will, on that physical layer test capability. We're also working with those interested within the TC15 community of Open Alliance to develop um, tooling, to develop the test plans, and pursue um, basically a structure that would enable our involvement so that we can put this capability into existence as rapidly as we can in 2022 with a desire to start before the year runs out. Though admittedly, we're into December and it's it's going to be a little bit of a challenge there, but our desire nonetheless remains the same to quickly push out PCS, FI control, 
um, test plans for review by the group so that we can have full semiconductor validation as much as the tooling will enable as uh, products hit the market uh, supporting the multi-gig uh, solutions. Now, we are working with um, various uh, companies supplying multi-gig solutions and tooling potential. So if you believe you have opportunities there, please reach out to us so that we have as much engagement as we can in the solutions that may be able to accelerate the validation of multi-gig. So again, that's an effort that is still forming. We'd invite your uh, uh, in inquiries and potential support there. We also expect to have one to two plug fests around the multi-gig space at least in the coming year uh, to help accelerate the validation of the tools and any additional interoperability validations that we can support um, during that process. And ideally travel in 2022 will be more permissive for everyone. <clears throat> a quick mention of a service that we've spun up in part related to our audio video bridging work um, where uh, a technology called Automotive Audio Bus or A2B has uh, come into existence principally pushed by um, analog devices but with an intention of eventually uh, having a multi-source agreement and uh, a more of an open specification. So our involvement there was helping to develop the interoperability testing of the main and sub nodes, assisting with test fixtures of, uh, of various physical air test needs uh, for signal integrity, um, as well as network level tests uh, to validate the systems there. So those looking at A2B, we may be able to assist you in addition to uh, the efforts that ADI may go through. And other suppliers, we're certainly open to discussing how we can assist in ensuring an interoperable A2B future. <clears throat> On to our TSN topics. Um, we have a, a few bits of news here. Um, we have our Bitfire test solution, which is, uh, um, uh, many years old at this point, FPGA that we've developed for DOT3 conformance testing, including relevant to this space, um, our single pair ethernet physical air tests are based around this platform for uh, signal generation, um, as well as preemption testing. Uh, we can generate negative test cases and uh, as well as uh, validate the behavior of um, uh, 101 gig uh, preemptible uh, systems in this space. For higher speeds, we also have the Keysight Ixia TSN solution, uh, as well as solutions from Xena Networks to help enable um, time wear shaping, preemption, and general uh, shaper uh, validation. For actual time quality, uh, we've had a long partnership with Calnex and benefit from a Paragon X available to us there. And for a variety of reasons, we have a, a project uh, underway that is uh, integrating TSN capabilities into our FPGA solutions, turning that into a NIC so that we can continue to extend our custom capabilities to meet the particular test needs, um, be it of a low nature, such as our PCS and fire control testing, or more classically in this space, the detailed conformance testing of dot one requirements around preemption, time war shaping, QCI, et cetera. And on that note, we do have a variety of, of test plans. Uh, the first mentioned here for preemption has been posted since 2017. We've hosted plug fests around this. Um, plug fests, mind you, that were also uh, supported by uh, Keysight Ixie at the time, which uh, it was much appreciated. Uh, the pandemic certainly has slowed down some of our plug fest desires. So looking forward to that being also a future potential. Um, we also have done a little bit of testing around the time we're shaper for some of our um, IP and silicon providers and have uh, emerging test plans for that, as well as ingress policing and a variety of PTP standards that have been in development for quite some time with support of NIST and the IEEE around 1588, 2008, 2019, uh, extending to the 2020 AS standard and a variety of PTP profiles be it the power profiles, the first two listed there, C37, 238, and 61850, 9.3, and some interest from the telecommunications community for the 8275 series of telecom profiles. So some of these are available today in a finished or draft form, and some will certainly be available in early 2022. The TSN profiles really are the problem. 
There's many standards and we can test the nuanced detail of a standard, but the standard has many different flavors. Um, I, I stopped counting at 42, frankly, but in the 6180, or sorry, 6802 profile alone, there's over 42 IEEE standards referenced just in that draft uh, profile. So there, there's a multitude of TSN and TSN related standards that it takes to make a profile, unlike the early AVB technology, which was primarily defined by five standards. And this really necessitates um, the, the profiles to come into existence because there are orthogonal um, features in some standards where once a choice is made, that's what the network now has to commit to. And that really comes back to a use, use case defined need, which certainly in the 802.1BA AVB profile was relatively straightforward to establish, but it's a longer process to address the industrial automation needs as the 6802 effort has been pursuing for several years, 802.1DG for automotive and the telecom and aerospace profiles are more recent additions to the TSN 802.1 effort that's moving towards this broad industry accepted profile need. In parallel to this and for specific large end user needs, I have been privileged enough to work with parties to develop two particular profiles that at least one, if not both, will be made public in 2022 to further, not just add to the mix here, but define and shape particular use cases that will, I hope, further accelerate uh, the need and adoption of TSM. Um, you might draw an analogy to the 1588 um, profile proliferation that some have um, you know, concerns with, but, but this I think is a different problem. And I do believe a proliferation of TSM profiles is only good for the industry as it allows us to put the right pieces into the right combination for a variety of use cases. Ah, Max asked, what is TSN? And I'm gonna take a, a pause to go back and try to address that. In my world, we're talking the whole set of TSN standards from 802.1. So we'll take a more detailed look at the question, Max, um, towards the end here. But for me, TSN is the various requirements of the 802.1 standards. It really comes back to the profile as far as what we need to test. And hopefully that starts to answer some of the question that, that you asked earlier. We'll, um, we'll come back to that. Um, we're just gonna take a few more minutes to talk about what we're involved with with the industry and some of the aspects we're seeing. And then we are gonna open it up to discussion and questions. So let me just uh, go through a few of these. Um, our industrial activities certainly have been um, primarily focused around the needs of the APL group, the Siemens uh, Profinet p and organization, Fieldcom group, ODVA, OPC foundation. And we have, in addition to that APL group, some discussion and some activities around supporting not just the physical layer test needs that APL drives, but how we can further assist with the TSN validation in these particular spaces as their specifications and use cases continue to emerge. Um, there's of course ongoing work with APL to extend that physical layer need. There's of course ongoing work with DOT3 um, beginning to look at under base T1L and that while distant is certainly something that we are paying attention to and, and considering as that moves forward. Um, near term, we're absolutely more focused in the physical layer space for industrial spaces on finishing the 10 base T1L semiconductor validation um, with the support of companies such as ADI and TI for which uh, my thanks is certainly given. Um, and we are still interested and open to working with the larger 6802 industrial profile activity for their conformity assessment or CA activity. Although that too, no doubt in part because of the pandemic has slowed as far as its ability to progress. And I look forward to that changing. We continue to support the needs of the Avenue Alliance. We are continuing to see interest in bridge certification and increased in interest in Avenue Automotive testing and in some cases certification. 
Uh, there's absolutely value in some of the testing that we're seeing. Um, certification is always a, a dicey topic and one of the topics that I'm sure will continue to be focused on as that particular program evolves to meet um, more recent OEM uh, demands. But we still provide tooling in the broader TSN and AVB space, um, typically in our, our platform that we refer to as Violet uh, for a software-driven test tool for controlling and integrating with various NICs and hardware platforms, such as the Keysidexia platform and others. And we're working with various other end users and OEMs to develop testing for their particular needs uh, around uh, the suite of AVB and TSN profiles, or standards rather. Um, and to this day, we still see a steady interest in the very detailed testing that we've established over the past 10 years uh, with the Avenue Alliance around BA, MSTAR RP, MRP, MSRP, MVRP, dynamic reservation protocols there and VLAN uh, registration protocols, as well as other relevant standards. With the Open Alliance, we continue to support their test plan development and migration to the uh, ISO standards process. Uh, many of those test plans are publicly on their website and of course more publicly once they're ISO standards. Um, that certainly takes some effort and as we have gone through that effort once already with the 100 base T1 TC1 activities. We're certainly eager to see the thousand base solutions uh, come along quicker um, and hopefully better, um, at least with fewer needs for errata. Um, and that really leads into the multi gig desire that um, I would like to see as a major effort within the 2022 timeframe to try to meet the needs of some OEMs looking to deploy that as soon as possible. And again, plug fests in this coming year, just around thousand base T1 and multi gig alone, I think would be quite active. Combining that with TSN activities could be quite interesting. We are continuing to work with the IEEE SA around their conformity assessment needs. Um, the 1588 power profile certification for ordinary clocks is uh, commencing as soon as the review of the current test suite specification is completed and finished as ballot. Um, boundary clocks and TCs are also being added into this mix. And no doubt there will be updates, be it for redundancy or newer profiles, as naturally that work continues uh, to support the needs of, in this case, the utilities and power industry. Um, and we are thankful to continue to have NIST engagement to ensure that the results we're gathering um, are reproducible and verifiable and correlate well with the equipment available from NIST. Um, so those interested, especially in the power space, um, certainly um, welcome further discussion on how we can work with you in the IEEE to go through an IEEE registry and certification process. And even if not for the power space, there may be opportunities for other spaces, be it telecom or elsewhere, to further enhance the awareness of standards compliant solutions uh, versus others in the industry. In a similar vein, we've worked with the Ethan Alliance since their inception and have um, in many regards hosted uh, a number of plug fests. We in fact had a plug fest more uh, test and measurement focused not um, two months ago. <clears throat> and we also continue to work with the um, POE certification interests of the Ethernet Alliance, um, including the, the new Gen 2 program um, that is enables multiple labs, but also has an auditing process that we help support to ensure a quality of, of service being delivered uh, to the industry there so that a EA um, POE certified product has a higher assurance of, of actually um, meeting the needs of the end customer. There's always the potential for the Ethernet Alliance to consider expanding their certification scope. And we're certainly open to those discussions if there's a market interest. We've also been heavily involved with the OCP or Open Compute project for some time. We've supported their past networking certification efforts, which have diminished of late, but we continue to work with them around the, their NIC 3.0 um, open uh, NIC effort for PCIe validation and test picturing. And we're exploring how we can engage with uh, telecom areas principally around the telecom infrastructure project, distributed service gateways, and uh, various telecom profiles as mentioned. 
So that's, that's another area of our lab's involvement that we may continue to expand our PTP and TSN interests and capabilities towards. And briefly, similar potential with ORAN, because there's so much talk we've put into automotive and industrial, I really do think there's um, many aspects of the TSN technology, not just 802.1cm, that can be of significant benefit uh, to the telecom space beyond just the telecom PTP profiles. And our expertise and know-how may certainly be of, of value there as um, open standards for heterogeneous interoperability such as ORAN uh, continue to gain traction. So that's, that's the quick update. That's the quick background. I have here several questions, and I hope you have some as well, um, that are um, fairly broad in scope as far as, you know, should we, is there, um, where should we go for areas such as 10 base T1S, uh, additional open alliance needs, um, continued expansion of silicon validation and ECU testing in automotive spaces, particular tooling capabilities that we may be able to accelerate and leverage, and simply TSN test plans and profile assistance that we could help accelerate to solve problems. So I appreciate the attention and I appreciate the uh, incoming questions. And I'd like to start processing that at this time. But uh, briefly uh, on screen, uh, my contact information, uh, Jason Six uh, who, on our single pair ethernet uh, side as well. Mike Gooding, who's on the call, uh, who assists us with some of our outreach and, and sales efforts. Uh, and Michelle Wisnant, who is uh, our, our point person when it comes to making sure we're not dropping a ball, getting a question answered properly, and, and otherwise keeping the operations going here. And Mara Johnson's also appreciated in helping to support this webinar. So with that, um, I think we're going to start opening up to uh, some verbal interaction, but I'll start trying to process uh, some of the asked questions as well. And perhaps if we can turn on Max's uh, microphone, I may or may not have answered all of your questions, Max, because um, I'm just uh, not sure how good I am at being able to get your microphone. There we go. I think you should be able to unmute Max if you'd like. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Find the right button too. Well, thanks. Um, for those who don't know me, Max Turner, um, currently with Ethernovia, I was part of the team. I think Bob was involved in that as well at the time when we created uh, BA and we introduced 1722 and ABB in automotive. At that point in time, I was working for BMW. Um, yeah, I mean, you answered my question, um, my, my first question even before you answered it, because it was basically answered on, on page 11 and 12, what you were considering. Um, yeah. what you were considering at TSM. Um, so in extending that question, my question was, how does that validation that you're presenting here on page 11, how does that work at the point where I'm combining some of these features? Like yeah. I do preemption and time-aware shaping. Um, yeah. I do um, preemption and 1AS or some of the other shapers. Is that something that's been under discussion? It, it, it absolutely has. And without a proper definition of how um, the profile would define the interaction of those standards, it can become quickly unbounded in, in my view. Um, I've certainly seen some discussion of, you know, uh, let's take a simple example, using the credit base shaper and the time war shaper and, you know, the acknowledgement that, of course, you can modify the credit base shaper to support a longer period of being denied access to the channel. So the high credit increments more because the gate is closed, but you still have to know by some agreed uh, profile, we'll say, how much at most the credit base shaper will be denied access to the, to the medium. Um, otherwise, you can't build the hardware to support, you know, and not to be absurd, but, you know, seconds long, you know, closed gate uh, is just not going to be readily supported. Um, there, there's also, you know, the questions of, of at diminishing value, perhaps, in, in mixing some of these shapers. Um, preemption in the time war shaper certainly is another uh, area of concern. Uh, how much guard bands one needs, exactly how you're handling the express traffic. Um, is the express traffic, I would hope, never blocked by the time war shaper, you know, but again, without profiles defining these things, you're making guesses. So I can focus to part of your question that you, you typed at least, focusing on the specific 
requirements of an individual standard is relatively easy. Looking at how they interact has to, in my view, come from these profiles. Um, so we know what the limits are uh, that we're expecting. Um, and that's a challenge because so many of the profiles are, um, you know, respectfully long in the tooth, but, you know, there's still not a lot we can, we can jump on uh, to look at there. And, and I respect the efforts. I, I, you know, the challenge of 6802 trying to support 100 um, hops and, and still maintain a, a timing expectation based on the modeling they're pursuing is fantastic. But I do have some end users who are happy with two hops. <laughs> you know, so what can we do to define and accelerate some of these use cases is an open question. I don't um, know how the answer that was, Max. <laughs> no, that was a very good answer, actually. And, and being the current editor of the 802.1DG group, um, I, I completely, I can completely echo what you're saying. And the, the main problem is that a lot of people feel that they're missing out on something if they say, I'm not using feature X, I don't even want to put an exact example to, to not confuse people. Um, but my feeling is a lot of people think they're missing out on something and they, they're scared to, for example, say in the profile, don't use that because, and I'm, I'm speculating now, but my, my gut feeling is they, they haven't quite understood what, what that feature might give them. And so they're worried that if they write down in the profile that it's not supposed to be used, that they're missing out on something. And this complicates what you've just described, Bob. And that's definitely not a question. Sorry about that. Um, I'll actually give it to other people that might actually have questions and less statements. No, that I appreciate it. Uh, we do have a question from Eric Para, I believe. Um, and I would welcome some other questions if, if folks um, have a question they'd like to speak through rather than type in, we, we can also ask you to raise your hand um, so that we can call on you. But uh, Eric, I believe you asked uh, the question um, effectively why I'm binning some single pair ethernet technologies into particular automotive terms. There's, there's 100 base T1 and um, 1000 base T1 versus industrial terms like uh, 10 base T1L. Um, there's certainly some um, market-driven realities there where 10 base T1L supporting kilometer long links is much more applicable in a production line. It might be used for automotive production, but it, it's still in an industrial setting um, versus the short reach 10 base T1S, be it point to point or the more popular, perhaps uh, multi-drop 10 base T1S that has appeal in some settings of automotive, but I'm aware of some other settings that 10 base T1S multi-drop has appeal that isn't automotive at all. It's just low speed, um, relatively high bandwidth compared to some other technologies that it might supplant um, if costs and, and validation and availability um, um, match uh, or exceed the capabilities of existing technologies that it might replace. Um, certainly an automotive focus comes from some of the activities around the, um, let me just put it on screen here. I'm not sure if I'm blocking the screen or not here. The, the open alliance is predominantly, of course, focused on automotive needs. So that drives a lot of the activity that we engage with. Um, but the Avenue Alliance absolutely has a broader scope, but even here, a lot of the activity is focused around the, the automotive capabilities at the moment, up until at least, um, let me get to the right slide here, the 6802 efforts um, around industrial uh, automation and the profile for same, um, that, that will certainly also pull in more single pair ethernet activities that aren't just 10 base T1L, for sure. Um, and it might not even be single pair ethernet in all cases. Um, one thing I think we all appreciate, um, TSN does not necessarily mandate the use of single pair ethernet. There are plenty of technologies that, um, or solutions that sit on top of classic 100 base TX, 1000 uh, base T, <clears throat> or other solutions where weight of cabling um, and, and such is far less the concern versus having a deterministic network uh, through which your application can be supported. So putting these things into bins is challenging. That's where the profiles really need to be driven by the use case um, rather than, and, and this is a problem and I know Max would agree with me. Um, I hear time and again, oh, we're gonna do TSN. To which my question is, 
great. You might as well tell me you're going to do Ethernet, 400 gig mm -hmm. or 10 meg. <laughs> Um, so please feel free to add more if I didn't answer your question, Eric. No, the uh, question is answered. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, thanks yes. for, yeah, thanks for, for reaching out to it. I, I also see that it's difficult to put things into bins, but I feel that, you know, 100 base T1, 1000 base T1, the multi gigs and 10 base T1S with the short length cable that you mentioned for 15 meters as it's in the standard, it's yes. pretty much for, yeah, applicable for cars. And obviously everybody in industry or even in the truck industry, they would say we want 40 or in the industry, they would say, as you mentioned, one kilometer. But mm -hmm. I have heard the term SPE being yes. more used for this. Um, I think it's IEC. Oh my God, I forgot the number. Something like 63881 or something like that. It's wrong number, but something along those lines where they are targeting 10 base T1L for industrial applications and it's the question about what connector essentially only and yeah they also look at the different protocols because they need um, uh, real-time capabilities there and they need uh, bandwidth uh, um, guarantees and quality of service uh, but yeah the, the topic here is SPE as a as a term yeah um, yes. do we do we you know is it is it more for the industrial part because I yeah or on the automotive ethernet side, I always say automotive ethernet. So how my, do you guys my, see it? My biased view, single pair ethernet is a little bit more agnostic a term, largely because, mm -hmm. you know, again, the open alliance has come in and being predominantly um, automotive focused, you know, any any reference to open, even though it's not specific in the name to automotive would, would imply that alliance and, and one pair for automotive purposes. Um, so we, 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 I'd find it simply as a monk gear that is most useful to dis explain the set of single pair ethernet technologies. The, the use case absolutely can vary and someone here may have it in their head better than I, but I believe thousand base T1 has a longer reach 40 meter uh, solution option that can be supported and is of interest to to some settings beyond just purely um, traditional automotive. Um, but again, there is absolutely um, um, different drivers uh, in these spaces. And I, you know, for the long reach reasons, that's why we will see um, 100 base T1L uh, come along and oops, I just realized that's a typo. <laughs> Um, that should say 100 base T1. We do not yet have 100 base T1L. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks yeah. for the input. Yeah. No, thank you for the question, Eric. And again, um, if anyone has uh, a desire to just type your question, please feel free to put that in the system. Um, I would very much love to hear from others on the call. I recognize some, but not all. Um, but if, if there's a topic that we've touched on that spurs a comment or a question, feel free to either unmute um, or... Um, 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 I, I would have a question now that I'm muted here. I got a big interest on the plug fests that you mentioned on the multi-gig, uh, multi-gigabit base T1 yes. parts. Uh, we've... Um, yeah, so how are these planned? Uh, that, that's uh, something I'd be interested exactly, in. Exactly as you're doing is how they're planned. I, I could take off on one hand how many companies I might expect to show up in a multi-gig event if I were to have one in two or three months. But I would welcome, you know, even if that's useful for the small handful of companies, um, we would certainly look at doing this. But I'm, I'm thinking more in the summer time frame. But that aside, so that we have time to discuss it, we would want to look at um, what's, what's the principal concern? Um, who else can we engage? We welcome partners, um, be it other labs or other test and measurement companies um, to certainly engage as well. We have a facility um, in our location in Durham, which is just one hour north of Boston, that makes it rather economical to host the Plugfest um, and perhaps convenient from those on the west coast of the US and in Europe to meet in the middle. Um, but we're certainly open to working with other parties, be it the Open Alliance, Avenue Alliance, Ethernet Alliance, if there's other venues um, that would make sense to host such an event. So uh, Eric, forgive me, I don't recognize uh, the company you're with. You don't need to disclose that here on the webinar, but certainly would welcome following up with you on your interest mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to disclose it's uh, Technica Engineering, um, yes. yeah, automotive industry and uh, yeah, very yep. the, from the beginning on automotive Ethernet uh, testing tools. 
Yeah, absolutely. And a colleague of yours was one of our last visitors right before our, our last shutdown. But fortunately, we are open again and certainly look forward to, uh, to having uh, visitors and plug fests uh, continue um, into the new year here. Um, Max, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Did I actually unmute? Yes, I did. Um, so my question was, did we, I mean, we did the Avenue profile, it feels like billions of years ago. Yeah. Have we actually, in going to the IEEE profiles, do you feel we have actually last information and should we maybe have stuck closer in some of the, or, or we could still do, we could still stick closer to the Avenue profile um, and where do you see the, um, well, the lessons learned fr from the Avenue profile versus having it now potentially in IEEE? So um, there's a lot of history there and I, I won't recap it all, um, but uh, you, you certainly were part of it. I, I think the biggest reason we've seen a slowdown is um, good, bad, or indifferent. We've added a lot of features to TSN um, and with a lot of features comes a lot of choice, a lot of evaluation um, and Classically, and in my opinion, still the best process for this is an open process in the IEEE to have as much participation as possible and as much views as possible brought in to the picture. That, by its nature, slows things down. Um, when we only had five standards and your choice of what shaper should we use, the credit based shaper, it's the only one you got, you know, what reservation protocol should I use? MSRP is the only one we got, you know, which timing protocol should we use? Well, we just finished writing GPTP, so we should use that one, right? Rather than an old 1588 based one, right? So let's use, the, that was an easy selection process. Here, you know, we've got some um, TSN telecom based uses that are using the ITU telecom PTP profiles as they should, they've invested the time to meet their particular needs to do that. So GPTP is no longer the end all be all, although I still would encourage it to be considered in as many use cases as possible. So we have a common timing layer where we can, but there's multiple shaper solutions, the time war shaper, um, the peristaltic shaper, the cyclic shaper, the um, asynchronous shaper, the newest uh, from Johannes and such. Um, and, and they all have their different advantages and complexities. The time war shaper is, is familiar to some in the industrial space and seen as problematic um, for other end users uh, between the need for everyone supporting the time war shaper and the scheduling of same. And I notice deliberately, I haven't talked about management at all in this discussion, um, but once we have standards compliance and interoperability, um, management has to be a focus. Security, of course, also has to be a focus. We do have efforts underway for the 1588 security key mechanism and the NTS network time security mechanism coming out of IETF for helping to secure timing at least. Um, and these, these things have to come together, but we can't do them all at the same time, uh, at least not um, to a, I would call a conformance test uh, degree. Uh, to Eric's earlier question, we can absolutely look at many of these aspects in a plug fest setting. And whether it's just a physical layer validation for multi gig or a combination of services, again, the forum is much less of my concern versus what the need is. Right? If, if, if it's not Avenue, is it IEEE? Well, that's okay. We work with IEEE. Is the Ethernet Alliance looking at bringing together and partnering with Avenue or such? That's fine. We work with them too. But um, there is a common time and place where you want to take um, the deterministic networking pieces, the physical layer aspects, um, the hardware time stamping, and, and any link issues you might have there, uh, channel problems. Um, the, the distributed timing and the security aspects and management aspects and try to push as much of that as you can together, but in a series of plug fests where we might make the physical layer aspects one focus, the next event being the protocols for deterministic networking, the next being you know quality of time validation and maybe management and then also security or perhaps security and quality of time at the same time. Um, I'm not at all claiming to have all the answers. This is why I want to have a series of these uh, at least every two months um, after the IEEE interims or plenaries uh, as best as we can schedule it 
and to have this type of open discussion. Um, it, it, I don't, it, at times, yes, we, we may talk about what UNH IOL is doing and how we can assist you. Um, certainly that's an interest, but I really wanna understand where we can go next to help and who best you see us being able to assist um, to meet your needs, because this is a communal effort. And a final comment, Max, before certainly uh, I'll turn it back to you. Um, despite the slowdown, I still think IEEE is the right venue. We get competing interests. There's always potential politics of some efforts might be deliberately to delay or slow or detract, but that's where, um, and you can certainly feel this one, Max, that's where it's a process of how well we can manage uh, both from a chairing process and a, and a balloting and commenting process to, to drive the effort towards at least an initial conclusion. If we try to boil the ocean, it will take forever. Go ahead, Max. I, 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 yeah, I totally agree. And this is what I'm seeing right now. People are desperately trying to boil the ocean because they're worried they're missing out on something. And yeah, this is, I'm, 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 Anybody having some advice here, how we might move forward with that? Um, I'm happy to um, happy to take on. Um, Bob has my contact details in case you want to get in touch. Yeah, and and I think I think it's the use case problem. And I made a comment. I think you and uh, to to your predecessor in your position, Craig, in the sense of dot one DG, Craig Gunther. Um, it, as soon as I can get some of this profile work that I've done. Um, at least either publicly available or shared and contributed to um, the relevant, um, you know, dot one DG or such. I, I would welcome that because I know in many cases we are starving for input. We, we are in need of having end users help define what these profiles need to do. And in tandem to this, there is an education problem. I, I think we all um, are running across this need of making um, those who are looking at these solutions aware that when they say, oh, great, I want to use TSN, well, you got to turn that around and ask the question, what are you trying to solve so that we can help shape that for you? Um, go ahead, Max. And you're muted, Max. Sorry, I think we both unmuted me. Um... Oh, sorry. I didn't quite do the job. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm there. Sorry, there is not much I can add. Um, I'll leave the floor to other input or questions. Yep, yep, no problem, no problem. Um, I won't call on an individual by name, but certainly if, if there's others, I see some from the semiconductor industry. I see some from alliances and, or closely working with alliances and forums. I, I see some from OEMs. I believe there's some here from test houses. I really would welcome um, views, questions, or even just a request for clarity. Um, we have a few minutes left to try to take advantage of everyone's collective time here. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, Bob, this is Ed. Jeremy and I are on the call together. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, it, I think it would be helpful, the, the very last slide that you had with questions that you're looking for input on, if you could share that or send it out, and then we can have some internal discussions and trying, if we get responses, we can give that feedback to the broader audience and yourself. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I do believe there's an intention of, of making these uh, more broadly available and um, yes, and I'm very interested. I mean, this is a very, uh, very useful update that you've provided since you're touching across a number of consortia that a number that several of us are involved in, and some very uh, good comments you've made about your observations within IEEE. So, I'd like to see if I could take those questions that you have and see if there are folks that are uh, that can provide us with some input and feed it back to this group. Yep, yep, absolutely. And and perhaps, um, let's see, it's December. We have our interim virtually in January. So perhaps in February, I will be giving um, those who can attend an update about our, um, we have an NSF activity that's in the US here, a National Science Foundation 
to form, it's a mouthful of acronyms, I'm sorry, IUCRC CDFI, which is an industry university collaborative research center for a center for digital factory innovation. And that's an effort that UNH and Georgia Tech and North Carolina State University are starting to support research in industrial cases, factory uh, cases that include a TSN component um, which is why I raise it here. Um, Ed, I know you and I have talked a little bit yes. about that particular yes. interest, and I didn't provide an update here. What I will in February is make sure that folks are aware of a meeting that we're having in Georgia Tech um, in uh, the March timeframe. But because February is very close to March, um, I mention it here just as that reminder to follow up with you, Ed, and anyone else here who has a digital factory interest in a research aspect of how can AI, machine learning, um, wireless sensors, TSN be commingled in a digital factory setting um, in a research aspect um, that may be of interest to your organizations. So that's Do you just, have the dates for that, Bob? Do you have the actual dates for that in March yet? I, I, not off the tip of my tongue, but I, I'll, I'll send them off to you and I'll, I'll try to add a bullet to the slides here before we share them out. Okay, great, thank you. So, so folks are aware of that. And, and that's really why I wanna to try to do these somewhat frequently and have this active discussion. There's a lot of forums many of us participate in, some may be new to myself uh, and some of the folks you're hearing from here, um, but I, I, I believe we have opportunities and perhaps to a degree there's a need for this because we've missed so much of this in the hallway discussions of all the various conferences that we have typically attended. Um, but I would welcome your further input, your further thoughts. I'd love to know you know, we're behind, I admit, in some areas like 10 base T1S. I know there's some interest in the industry. If we had been servicing that a year ago or more, people would love it. I know there's opportunities where we could perhaps assist with more open alliance coverage because automotive interest remains high, whether it's for interoperability testing, TC8 or TC11. But we also know there's solutions out there. And our drive is more to fill a need than it is to necessarily um, um, provide yet another option when there's plenty of good choices in the industry. Um, but there's so much to do. We, I, I would welcome thought on where you see our ability to assist and or to build the community, be it in any of the settings we've mentioned um, or, or perhaps continue to grow um, where we can take uh, this particular setting, whether it's the research topic I just mentioned or, or otherwise. So in, in the closing minutes, um, I, I thank you, Ed, for reminding that we are asking for your input. Um, from this discussion, is there any other question or thoughts or requests that any in attendance might wish to raise? We'd love to hear from you. I know there was one comment, Bob, in the Q&A from oh, David, but I didn't know. So. Uh, David, would you like the floor? Please feel free to unmute. Sure. If I uh, have hit the proper unmute. Yep. Uh, so I'm in the ag industry and a thousand base T1 type B. Uh, I've spoken to Bob before. He knows that that's uh, very important to our and similar industries where the equipment is very large. So the 40 meter is attractive. Most systems don't need 40 meters, but they need a lot more than 15 just to avoid the cost of repeaters and, and uh, you know, I think the latency of a repeater is at the moment not significant, but it's really a cost factor. So uh, I heard you mention that there's you know many people represented on this uh, forum today from silicon providers to test houses and end users. So I wanted to you know make that known that uh, uh, ag industry, earth moving machinery, mining equipment, and on road truck and trailer, we have uh, collectively been chatting uh, and collaborating together because of this like-minded need for the, you know, the large equipment and the type B. So I didn't really have a question, just wanted to uh, make that known and see if there's others, uh, perhaps other industries or silicon providers that are ready to you know, deliver a type B part. That, that's a great question, David. One quick request. Do you feel comfortable disclosing the organization you work with? Uh, yeah, I don't mind a bit. The organization is the Ag Industry Electronic Foundation, and that is AEF 
hyphenonline.org. And uh, my career prior to working directly with AEF was through John Deere, so a fairly well-known ag company. Uh, but I'm not speaking on behalf of John Deere. They have the need. So does every other ag supplier, uh, OEM and implement manufacturer for this type B technology. I cannot and speak as directly for the earth moving machinery, mining and on-road trucking other than uh, some leaders of some different ISO and industry groups in those areas. We collaborate quite regularly. So I'm, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of the message that I think they would share if they were on this call. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, David, and thank you. I, I, I wanted to make sure folks were aware that um, uh, how to get in touch with you and, and uh, AEF uh, try to promote this. Um, the, while, while I won't put words in other folks' mouth, uh, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like a, a, a quick uh, comment before we uh, end today's session. Um, I would encourage some consideration if, if those hearing my voice at the moment have not looked at the 40 meg, 40 meter, sorry, um, uh, gigabit, thousand base T1, single pair ethernet uh, solution, type B as it might be referenced. Um, and, and certainly would encourage some consideration in that space um, if you have um, a potential value, uh, you know, 15 meters only gets you so much, you might be able to push some existing solutions further, um, but there are specs and, you know, this is part of the challenge with these TSN standards. We have so many of them. How many will really be adopted and how many will be well used? Um, there's not a guarantee simply because the standard was done. But type B certainly can fill a need. Um, David just raised one of them. And that is certainly an area where we could potentially have a plug fest, um, not just for the thousand base T1 needs that may still exist as problematic for some users, um, but you know, the type B uh, use case, as well as the multi-gig could all be part of those plug fists we look at in this coming year. So this is exactly the type of feedback I, I welcome and thoughts and discussion. Um, I'd like to hear your feedback um, afterwards as much as you wish to share on how well um, this was a use of your time and, and whether you found it valuable and if you have any thoughts on um, how we could structure this moving forward. But I'd like to have a, another meeting, perhaps uh, in that February timeframe, to update our progress, our plans around plugfests, and hear your ongoing needs. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to see through 2022 um, a ramping up of uh, you know these profiles that we've addressed, having a need uh, to to make progress and uh, hopefully come closer to conclusion. While we also drive our own test and evaluation capabilities, plugfests, and our various partners. Uh, within the industry. So uh, with that, I really appreciate your attendance and your time. Um, please feel free to reach out with other questions and, um, uh, and your feedback on this process. And I look forward to hearing from you um, in the months ahead. And if I don't speak with you beforehand, I hope everyone has a happy holiday period and a happy new year. Thank you very much for attending today.